by one year. And the lower 48 went steeply down the other side. Um, and there are a couple of things to say about that really steep descent. One is this, that let's be polite. Let's just say it shaped the face of the modern world. Uh, it shaped US foreign policy. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but uh, if that peak of production hadn't happened, US foreign policy would have been very different. They wouldn't have had to go around the world arming some despots, uh, bombing others, and struggling desperately to find some construct to hold it all together other than protection of oil uh, reserves. The other thing to say about it is if uh, somebody from BP was here now, um, as they would seek to persuade you that what you're hearing is exaggeration, they'd point to enhanced oil recovery. They'd say, you know, the average field, we only get 30% of the oil out of it, actually. And there's a whole array of technologies we can throw at this problem that we have developed. We can pump detergents underground that free up more oil that increases the recovery. We can drill sideways and even horizontally through oil fields, and they can. And that, obviously, if you're not doing a vertical hole but a horizontal hole, that is going to increase your recovery. And we can, in some cases, we can lift that up to 60% recovery in a field. We can do that. Answer, yes, you can. It's very impressive. Well done, you've got great kit. But they invented almost all those techniques in America, and they threw almost all those techniques at the downside of that collapse in oil production, and it's made not a jot of difference. So this is, a, I think, a critical argument. And in 1998, um, uh, Colin Campbell from Ireland here and John Lahaire from France were the first of the oil industry early toppers to speak out. They did it in an article in Scientific American. Uh, and they basically made the point, simply stated, look, if this can happen to America, it's going to happen to the world. And we think, indeed, that this is what is coming up in uh, world oil production. So now let's look at that, world oil production. And this now is Exxon data. This is the past discovery uh, year by year with the discovery of the reserves backdated to the year in which they were found. And then in yellow, the past production. And you can see several things here. First of all, and this is one to try on your friends um, at a dinner party, with all its money, all its technology, all its resources, what year do you think it was that the global oil industry found the most oil in any year that they were ever going to find? And the answer to that question is so long ago, it was even before England last won the World Cup. The peak there is 1965. The other thing you notice is the two big um, peaks in the histogram going up here. This is Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. The big fields get discovered early on. That applies country by country, province by province. It applies in the world. If you look at the stats of the decline of the size of oil fields through here, you can see a clear decline, and I'm going to show you just some of those stats in a minute. The last time the industry found a province was the North Sea here in the late 1960s, and it's been well over a quarter of a century since they've discovered in any one year as much as we have consumed. So the critical thing here is where is that curve going to go? We are expecting it to go up here. And what is going to happen here in terms of future discovery? Because if it does go up here, then this very clear and obvious downward trend is going to have to somehow be arrested. The expectation of future production takes us on up through um, the 84 million barrels, or uh, 85 that we're burning today, through 90, through 95, through 100, um, beyond, even in some formulations, right up to 120 million barrels a day. And that is the key question. What will they find going ahead? And there's a very important point here. If any of you are geologists and want to go out and look for an oil field tomorrow, and you find one, the average period between its discovery and oil coming into the world market is six years now. Uh, this is often because, of course, they're looking in places that are increasingly far flung, flung like Sakhalin and, and Siberia and Russia. Now, the other thing we have to, do at, uh, we have to look at um, is the green histograms. How reliable are them? I just are they? I just reported them as proved reserves. 
but are they proved? And this is uh, data from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. It's a sort of Bible of energy statistics that, that's produced every year. And these are the stats from each year, and they've been divided into the Middle East and the rest of the world. And you look at that and you think, wow, Jeremy, oh, really, what are you talking about here, man? Um, they, in 1970, had just over 600 billion barrels of proved reserves, and it's been going up ever since. It's now up at 1,100 billion barrels, right? So what on earth have we got to worry about? A lot of the increase happened in here um, in the mid-1980s, and if you look in here, it happened in the Middle East. That's when a lot of oil was discovered, right? Well, let's look um, a bit more closely, but first of all, always read the small print. This is the Bible of uh, energy stats, and um, is it the BP view? The estimates have been compiled using a variety of primary official sources. The reserves figures shown do not necessarily meet the SEC definitions and guidelines, and, wait for it, since the Shell Reserves fiasco of 2004, in this book, they've put the following caveat in, nor necessarily do they represent BP's view of proved reserves by country. Referee! You know, this is used by research students, undergraduates, journalists, all over the world, um, when they talk about energy. So what are they doing? They don't put question mark or inverted commas around proof. They report this as proved reserves. So I think we have a problem here, and I'm really quite irate about it. I do point it out to the guys from BP, and you know, people look a bit shifty and come up with feeble excuses, and they haven't changed it yet. Um, but this is where we have to look. And it was Colin Campbell who first drew attention to all this. You look at the uh, OPEC countries in the Middle East uh, by production figures through the years, something started happening in 1985 in Q8. Overnight, they decided that their reserves could be increased by around a third, from 64 to 90 billion barrels. A couple of years later, they increased them yet again to 92, and that was too much for the other countries. They too started playing the same game. Their geologists had been too conservative, they said. I like Saddam Hussein's approach to this. He was on 47.1 billion barrels. He thought the next day, okay, we'll just jack it up to 100. Nice round figure. Um, and, you know, Abu Dhabi, very cheeky, up from 31 to 92. And Saudi Arabia had been cranking away with the same numbers for a while. They're always the, um, the most tolerant voice in, uh, in the OPEC camp. Finally, they too started playing the same game and went up from 170 to 258. Then, if you look at the figures from here, this um, is barely credible. Just look at how similar they are going forward in the brown columns. And what we're asked to believe here is that every year, each one of these countries manages to find almost exactly as much oil as it produces. What a coincidence, isn't it? Um, and, in fact, what we think is going on, what Colin first drew attention to um, quite bravely is that the quotas agreed by OPEC were in, in, in 1982 and they were based on the size of national reserves. So let's use polite language, the massaging of the data started in 85. And these reserves, which are close to scrutiny, I mean, the, the oil industries were nationalized in these countries a quarter of a century ago and more, and foreign, foreign um, 80% of the world's oil is produced by national oil companies, not the BPs and the Shells and the Exxons. They only produce 20% of it. So we don't really know. Uh, none of this would stand up to scrutiny in a, in a court of any description, and there is even evidence of concern in the G8 there was a, a phrase in the G8 statement uh, saying uh, this year, at the end of the G8 summit, saying, guys, can we come in? Can we check uh, how much oil you've got? Because it really does rather depend on um, our way of life, depends on, on what you've got down there. So let's just look quickly at some of the stats of um, uh, giant oil fields. We call them giant oil fields, half a billion barrels, but actually, you know, we're burning at 84 million barrels a day, so 500 million barrels, that's not even a week's supply, right, of world 